Hall of Fame induction weekend is coming up. We'll be live in Cooperstown on Friday. Fred McGriff and Scott Rowland are going in. So this is a good year to examine what the writers get and what the writers miss. I sometimes hear the thought, if you have to think about it, the guy's probably not a Hall of Famer. I can't tell you how much I disagree with that. It often takes a few years for perception and reality to line up. And some Hall of Famers that we now consider no doubters required years of thought before getting in. Let's give some greats some Cooperstown justice. All right, so this year, a Veterans Committee righted a wrong and voted in Fred McGriff. McGriff, until his final year, never got more than 25% of the vote. You need 75%, 25% is not close. And yet the Veterans Committee with a deep ballot and everyone limited to just three votes unanimously voted in McGriff. 16 of 16. It's as if everyone suddenly came to their senses. When he was voted in, it was as if the entire baseball world woke up to Fred McGriff being worthy of being a Hall of Famer. And now it's obvious to most everyone that he should be in. This sort of thing has happened throughout the history of Hall of Fame voting. It's kind of a mass hysteria phenomenon. If everyone is thinking something is correct, it will appear correct, even if it's wrong. We're herd animals. We're much better at agreeing with each other than thinking independently and critically. Now, I know you're thinking, that's not really true. Okay, let's go back. When he retired, Yogi Berra, obviously the best catcher of all time, of course, he was voted in in his second year on the ballot. Yogi! That was 1971. Now, the Hall of Fame voting perhaps was still becoming established, but really? Winning as player of all time? Yogi Berra? Ten World Series titles? Most home runs ever at catcher? Year two? Yogi? I guess there was small hall. How about this? When Eddie Matthews hit his 500th home run, there were only seven, seven players in that 500 home run club. Seven. The most prestigious group in the sports world. Fourth most in National League history. He waited five years to get voted in. Eddie Matthews, fifth year on the ballot. Let's go through a few more. Duke Snyder, an eight-time All-Star, voted in in his 11th year on the ballot. Hoyt Wilhelm, before Mariano Rivera, the greatest relief pitcher in the history of baseball. Eighth year on the ballot. Wilhelm, by the way, started one season, led the league in ERA. He missed three years to World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Hoyt Wilhelm. They made that guy wait eight years. Come on. Johnny Mize also missed three years to the war, the big one. But in the 10 years wrapped around it, he slugged 588. Mize was a 10-time All-Star, five-time World Series champ. He was never voted in by the writers, and like McGriff, had to wait for the Veterans Committee. Johnny Mize, one of the best hitting first basemen in baseball history. 15 years on the ballot, had to wait for a Veterans Committee. I'm stunned, I, I wrote that, I'm stunned, just even reading it. Now admittedly, the voting was a little different in the old days. I didn't even bring up the great DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio waited three years because voting, the process, was still in its infancy in the 1950s. DiMaggio not getting enough votes is, of course, ridiculous, but the voting process did become more standardized and more publicized as of, say, the 1980s. I was watching it, and yet the small hall mentality was still a thing. Now, for anyone who thinks, if I have to think about it, the vote is no, then you'd be saying no to some obvious Hall of Famers. Harmon Killebrew, there he is in the middle. Harmon Killebrew was a six-time home run champ. He waited four years. Billy Williams of the Cubs, six years. One particular ballot, the writers had three 300-game winners, and only one got in, Steve Carlton. Don Sutton and Phil Necro, they each waited five years, 300-game winners. How about catchers? I know you're thinking Carlton Fisk, right? Gary Carter, they were first year, right? First ballot, right? Yeah, no. Fisk year two, Carter year six. Incredible. Goose Gossage, obvious Hall of Famer. There's the goose. What does that say? Ninth year on the ballot. These guys are not borderline candidates. There are players near the border. These players are not in that group. But the perception didn't match the careers. Sometimes we're just not thinking straight. We all start thinking a certain way, and it holds up for years. We're in that right now. Don Mattingly should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, he didn't do it long enough. Who says? If you're a voter, you say. Everyone agrees he was great and one of the most beloved players in the century of baseball. Dale Murphy is an obvious Hall of Famer. He didn't do it long enough. Who says? If you're a voter, you say. And the Hall of Fame is a better place with Dale Murphy and Don Mattingly in it. They make the Hall better and bring a flood of positive baseball memories to an entire generation. Why don't we want that? There are other candidates that I believe are Hall of Famers that, for whatever reason, just don't get a lot of support, and it doesn't make sense to me. These are the guys who slipped off the writer's ballot just in the last few years, got below 5% of the vote. Bernie Williams, Johan Santana, Jim Edmonds, Kenny Lofton. We can debate it, 
but they should be on the ballot. These guys are off the ballot. They're Hall of Famers. Dwight Evans, Keith Hernandez, Don Mattingly, Dale Murphy. I would also add Thurman Munson and Oral Hershiser. How about some more lost to history Hall of Famers? Tug McGraw and Sparky Lyle. Take a look at the postseason records of those guys. Those guys were big stars. I was a kid, Mike Lowell, but I was watching them. Big stars, not under the radar, won championships. Sometimes we get into a group think, and we all agree, and we agree wrongly. It's happened before. It just happened this year. Finally, Fred McGriff is going in. Time to follow up on that thread.